Hello, everyone. My name is Shuvalay Majumdar. I'm the program director for the Center for Advancing Canada's Interests Abroad at the McDonald Laurier Institute and Monk Senior Fellow for Foreign Policy. Uh, I'm so excited to be joined by Sarah Teach today. Uh, Sarah Teach is a really accomplished lawyer. Uh, I'm actually going to ask you, Sarah, before we jump into this, so, so that we can get you situated in the minds of our audiences. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you come into the field of law and particularly international law? So I came into the field of law after already being in the field of counterterrorism. And I actually only went to law school to advance myself in that field and then realized how much I loved law itself. And international law just came naturally. After my first year of law school, I worked at the International Criminal Court and it just it kept going from there. You did your JD in the University of Toronto? I did, yes. And you studied psychology and other really interesting human interest kind of uh, subject disciplines at McGill? Yeah, that was my first degree. It was a Bachelor of Arts in Science. We all start with that. <laughs> and then, yeah. but, you also, but you also went to Israel. Yes, I did. My master's degree was in Israel in uh, counterterrorism and homeland security studies. So you didn't go to, you didn't do your JD at the University of Toronto just to try and become a corporate lawyer. This has been a purpose for you from the beginning. It has, yes. And how did you discover that? Where did you, how do you relate to that? Hmm. Well, I guess it goes back to this professor I had at McGill, Professor Aaron Shore, if he ends up watching this. Uh, he was researching similar stuff from the perspective of sociology. And I remember thinking, gosh, that sounds so cool. If only I could do something like that. Because at the time, of course, I was being pressured by my parents to go into medical school. And uh, I realized, hey, wait a minute. Yes, I can. I can absolutely do something like this. And I just applied for an internship at the International Institute for Counterterrorism. And it just it kind of went from there. One thing became the next. And here you are. Exactly. Publishing perhaps one of the most important papers that I think the McDonald Laurier Institute is going to put out this year. I'm very proud of this work. I'm very proud of you for publishing it with us. Uh, and I'm especially uh, proud of the fact that, you know, the extremely renowned, powerful international human rights lawyer, uh, he's a senior fellow at the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. That's a place that's populated with great friends of the Institute. We're big admirers of Erwin Kotler and his work there. But David Mattis, David Mattis has decided to write the introductory piece for your paper. And if you'll forgive me for indulging uh, a little bit of the introduction here, I think it's a perfect way to kind of open this conversation. He says, this report called Exploring State Liability for the COVID-19 Pandemic, Legal Frameworks and Potential Avenues of Recourse by Sarah Teach is a thorough canvassing of the subject matter in which the title describes. For anyone who wants to find out what remedies there are, what can be done, this report has answers, lots of them. Ms. Teach notes that legal liability is less about blame and more about responsibility and compensation. So I couldn't think of a finer way than to quote David Matus and how he describes your report. Um, let's start with the very basics of this. Explain to our viewers exactly what your report is about. Summarize in very brief terms so that even you know, the, the layman, the, the, the new person to the issue can try and wrap their heads around what you're trying to uh, argue here. Sure. <clears throat> so this report is about, as you said, seeking responsibility for COVID because there have been compelling uh, allegations that the Chinese and Iranian governments both contributed to this cover-up, which contributed to a global spread and the pandemic that we're now in. There was a, a study out of the University of Southampton recently that found that if interventions had been conducted three weeks earlier, cases would have been reduced by 95%. That's, that's pretty huge. When you translate that into the dollar figures and the number of deaths that would have been prevented, that's a huge, huge difference. So it's about holding these governments accountable under the law because as David Matas also says, no one is above the law, no government is above the law. So this report really seeks to lay out specifically how we can go about doing that. And there are about 15 avenues of recourse. It's certainly a thorough paper, but I think this is actually something really important in the Canadian debate because you know we're, we've all been essentially jailed in our homes or subject to being in hospitals. We've had to deal with a calamitous economic fallout of which we're discovering and reporting you know, in the, in the finance minister's budget snapshot will have tremendous consequences on Canada's fiscal framework. 
Yet so many people seem to think that this is kind of like an invisible, blameless en- uh, event, that somehow there are, are, there's no responsibility that should be ascribed to anybody. Do, do you see this as, as uh, a correct part of the Canadian debate and that there is no quarter for blame, but that blame does rest on the actions of individuals or states? I No, I mean, I, I think that countries that have contributed to this should be held to account. And it's not about blame. It's about responsibility. It's about compensation. As you mentioned, the deficit is estimated now to be $343 billion. Why should Canada have to bear the brunt of that? The answer is we shouldn't. And there are avenues through which we can hold these other governments to account. That's what international law is for. And there are domestic avenues as well. So let's talk and about this these is a other great governments. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. So let's talk about these other governments. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us why you kind of zero in on China and on Iran. Well, China, I think, is fairly obvious. Obviously, the virus originated in China. And Iran was an early hotspot. And there are interesting parallels between both of these governments, where when they both concealed evidence of the outbreak, they both underreported data, participated in disinformation and misinformation campaigns, silenced whistleblowers. And there have been, there's been wide coverage of both of these government government's actions in the press, more so on China than Iran to date, but certainly both. So now, if I'm not mistaken, um, your main argument was that the cover up by both China and Iran was illegal. Like it was not legal for them to hide information, to not participate in the international forum that were designed to respond to crises. Um, in fact, I'd argue, and I think you successfully described the case that they went much further than just hiding the issue. So tell us, what do you think is um, the actual cover up that China and Iran had done that made this pandemic the global uh, event that it has become? Uh, sorry, Shiv, do you mean like factually or in terms of the the specific international treaties that have been breached here? The, the specific treaty, like why is what they did illegal? Right. So this is the crux of the argument, really, because these are international crimes. And there are about four, two more clear than, than the other two. And so I'll start with the two that are clear. So that, that came out really weird in terms of the phrasing. We can edit this, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Even if we can't, uh, it's, 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 it's totally authentic. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> okay. Um, so first off, there's the international health regulations, and that's received a lot of coverage in the press. And those mm-hmm. are, you know, the WHO international health regulations. And specifically, Articles 6, 7, and 44 contain obligations on states to share information with the WHO and with other member states. China, Iran, Canada, the U.S., all countries that are member states to the World Health Organization. So those regulations are binding. The question becomes, and uh, the question becomes about enforceability, of course, but I will get to that later. Um, but yeah, these are clear breaches of the international health regulations, and that's been covered quite a lot in the press. The one that's received less press is the human right to health. And that's a really interesting one because the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, or the ICESCR, protects and enshrines the human right to health. And that also specifically includes obligations on member states to protect the public health, to not engage in, in the spread of disinformation or misinformation. And that those obligations actually extend globally. So that's another very clear breach on the part of China and Iran for failing to protect the human right to health, both among their own citizenry and around the world. The and other so- two that are... Yeah, please continue. Yeah, go on. Uh, the other two breaches that are less uh, less clear and more maybes are uh, the uh, Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and the Biological Weapons Convention. So the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court criminalizes, uh, among other crimes, crimes against humanity. And I argue in the report that there's a possibility that this cover-up could be construed as a crime against humanity. It actually fits many of the definitional requirements. And the Biological Weapons Convention, uh, we all, we'll have to wait to see what information comes out in terms of an investigation, but it's certainly possible as well that this was a breach of, the, of that convention. So for each of these four, five kind of areas where you identify that there are conventions in place that make what China and Iran have done uh, illegal, um, how would a state like Canada pursue 
that justice, that accountability in each of these forums? Does it apply as an individual member? Does it apply as part of a coalition? Technically, how do we make it known that we intend to seek um, uh, the definition that what, what China and Iran have done are indeed illegal, uh, and then to pursue uh, due process in each of these four areas? Right. So in terms of the human right to health and the ICSCR, Canada can, and for the record, citizens can do this as well for this one, we can lodge complaints with the uh, special repertoires. Uh, there are several that are relevant. There's one for health. There's one for Iran specifically. There's one for uh, international collaboration. Uh, there's also the possibility of uh, communicating or lodging a complaint with the UN Human Rights Council, which is in turn empowered to launch commissions of inquiry and make condemnatory resolutions. That's, of course, complicated by China's position on the UNHRC, but it exists nonetheless. In terms of the international health regulations, uh, a complaint can be lodged with the Director General of the World Health Organization or against, uh, against the World Health Organization to the World Health Assembly. Then in terms of the International Criminal Court, any state party can request a preliminary examination by the prosecutor's office. The Biological Weapons Convention, that goes through the UN Security Council, again, complicated by China's veto vote. And um, beyond those more specific avenues, there's also always the possibility of going to the International Court of Justice or the Permanent Court of Arbitration or the World Trade Organization in this case, because I, I believe this can also be framed as a trade dispute, bilater bilateral investment treaties. Uh, I think that basically covers it. But there are a lot of Ooh. options for us. Yeah, and these are all very practical steps that the government of Canada could initiate either individually or as part of a coalition on each of these forums with other countries and other member states. This is not something that Canada needs to pursue alone, is, is my understanding of it. No, of course not. In fact, we should we should pursue it with other countries. We should involve our allies. This should be a large scale coordinated effort in deciding which avenues we want to pursue, with whom, and what to prioritize. This should this should absolutely be something that we see as a package. Well, it's interesting. I mean, this is, I think, what multilateralism was designed to afford for countries like Canada to cooperate with others. Um, and, and we created these forums of cooperation for reasons. Like, they weren't just created to exist in a vacuum so that uh, states, as you know, like China or Iran can come and manipulate them, <clears throat> but they actually serve a purpose for how we can seek accountability and cooperation. So, I, so thank you for detailing that rather thoroughly. Um, what what kind of modalities are there around the questions of enforcement? Um, let's presume that these applications are and petitions are successful. Uh, at the end of the day, how do we make sure that China or Iran, once tried and convicted, if I could put it in such crude terms, um, actually um, implements the decisions that are made? The short answer is we can't for most of these. In terms of the UN human rights bodies, they have huge enforcement limitations. The WHO is probably even worse. The International Criminal Court, International Criminal Court uh, sorry, has probably more teeth to it because if a official is, uh, uh, if there's a warrant out for that person's arrest, then any member state to the ICC has an obligation to uh, extradite that person to the court in The Hague. Uh, the UN Security Council has the power to make binding resolutions, but of course, with China on it, that's a practically that's not really a good option at all. Um, the World Trade Organization is a good one for enforceability because simply by becoming a WT, WTO member state, each country, and that includes China, have already agreed to abide by any decision coming out of the dispute settlement body, and that has some enforceability there. Bilateral investment treaties, similar, uh, by signing these agreements, the countries have already agreed to abide by any decision that comes out of an arbitration. So some of them are more enforceable than others, but really these limitations are why we should be pursuing multiple options all at the same time. And that's a great rationale for why you never quite know which way would be the most, most, the most effective way to seek accountability. Where do you see it heading? Right. Um, do you see, based on your research to date, uh, and it is quite cutting edge, do you see that there is uh, gathering momentum around these types of actions or is it still pretty early days? It's still early days. What we're seeing in the States, which is interesting, is a lot of domestic lawsuits and then a lot of legal experts coming out and talking about how that's not a good idea at all. And we're seeing proposals in the U.S. to uh, 
open up sovereign immunity to enable these lawsuits. And that seems to be where things are going in the U.S. I'm not sure if that's where what will follow in Canada. We tend to be less litigious. Yeah. It's, it's hard to say. Actually, let me let me take you back on that point. What, what does it actually mean to open up sovereign immunity? So <clears throat> I'll take it back a, a step. Sovereign immunity is this general principle that foreign states should not be subject to the jurisdiction of domestic courts, be it in the U.S., Canada, wherever. And that is important for, you know, engagement, multilateral engagement. It's offering states some protection and assurances that they can do various various things with other states and they won't be hauled into their domestic court systems. Um, however, there's been a move to a more restrictive sovereign immunity so that states that, for example, uh, I'll give you an example of, with the personal harm exception. So if a state comes in and tortures a Canadian citizen in Canada, they can't not be sued in Canadian courts. So there are exceptions, but those exceptions are fairly narrow. And there are only three that really may apply to the case of COVID and three that have been used and cited in these U.S. Uh, claims. And I, each of these three isn't really a good fit uh, because they are so restrictive. So I already forgot what your question was. That's what sovereign immunity is. No. And that's yeah, no, that's a good definition of it. The exceptions. No, that's a good definition of, of how those exist and why they're difficult to kind of uh, surpass or to address. Now, you know, it's interesting that in the absence of uh, potential success in the multilateral space uh, from where we've started, your paper also reflects on the domestic options, meaning we are seeing some experimentation in the United States with how to, to address it. You've done an excellent job of describing that right now. Uh, in Canada, what do you think are some of the domestic instruments that we have to pursue the accountability on the regimes of Iran and China. Um, and I know your report's gotten into this. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about what you think uh, Canada could do. So I'll talk a tiny bit more about domestic lawsuits because there actually is one possibility in Canada that has a slightly higher chance of success, in my opinion, than the others. And that is launching a lawsuit against specifically Iran using the Justice for Victims of Terrorism Act. The JVTA carved out an exception uh, in the Canadian sovereign immunity space for acts of terrorism. And unlike the U.S. definition of terrorism, which is fairly narrow, our definition is a little bit wider, but only permits lawsuits against listed state supporters of terrorism. China is not on that list. Iran is on that list. And because our definition is a little bit wider, there's a possibility that that can fit the definition. It's who knows if that would succeed? It's not a perfect fit, but that is a, a possibility. Uh, another possibility is, as I said, uh, passing a bill to amend our sovereign immunity rules. It's to specifically allow these sorts of lawsuits. And then moving on from lawsuits, there's the possibility of listing Islamic officials under the Magnitsky Acts, which would have the effect of imposing travel restrictions, property blocking sanctions on officials who were involved in these in these international acts. Uh, there's also the possibility of levying economic sanctions against the governments themselves using our Special Economic Measures Act. Uh, there's more novel legislation we could pass, like I saw a, a proposal in the, the, from the Hudson Institute that was really interesting, talking about specifically uh, sanctioning uh, in officials who were involved in concealing critical public health information. We could also amend the Magnitsky Act to that effect. So there are a lot of legislative options we can do in addition to, to sanctions. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, you've, you've offered an array of instruments that we have in Canadian domestic law. What would you say is probably the biggest um, vacuum in the Canadian sanctions instruments, whether it's a Special Economic Measures Act, the JVTA, the Justice for Victims of Terrorism Act, uh, the Magnitsky legislation? I know that's a colloquial we use to define sanctions on the basis of human rights. Um, if you had a magic wand and you could somehow a convene parliament and two get them to debate a particular bill, what would be your omnibus bill to say, these are the instruments we actually need in law for Canada to be able to be more effective in the international legal space? It's a great question. And wow, what a situation to find myself in. Um, I suppose I would start with the Magnitsky Act. That's the biggest gap and most obvious gap in my mind because that act permits sanctions in a number of specific circumstances, and those are, you know, extrajudicial killings, torture, corruption, significant corruption, and um, crime, uh, uh, crimes against uh, whistleblowers and other human rights defenders. So silencing whistleblowers would fit that. So the biggest gap there is that it, on the face of it, it doesn't seem to allow for 
sanctions against people who concealed critical public health data, and it really, really should. So I would change that and open that up right away. That would be, in my mind, fairly easy to do. Maybe some kind of reporting mechanism so that they would have to explain to the Canadian public why they're not listing people, because a problem we've had is that no Chinese or Iranian officials have been listed under the Magnitsky Act to date. So you can have the legislation, but you still have to have some assurances that the government will act. So I think this is actually a really important point, Sarah, because we saw very recently in um, a, a, a parliamentary session, I want to call it modestly reflecting question and answer, um, in which the opposition critic Garnet Genuis had asked former uh, had, had asked uh, Foreign Minister Champagne about whether or not there would be an openness to impose Magnitsky sanctions on um, on China, for, specifically for the situation in Hong Kong. Um, you think that if the government of Canada were to proceed with imposing Magnitsky sanctions, it could also serve as a basis for how accountability could be sought for the COVID crisis at large as well? Yes, it's a it's it's an important step. It it, it indicates to the Canadian public that we are taking this seriously, that we see the responsibility of these officials and we're doing something about it. And I think it would mark an important shift in how Canada interacts with China on a broader scale, because that mm -hmm. clearly is something that needs a reset in general. And COVID has been a really great wake up call to that effect. Exactly right. So, you know, it's interesting on the multilateral space, um, on the world stage, you've articulated um, the institutions that would have opportunity to pursue uh, accountability on China and Iran in the construct of international law. And as, as I think you might agree, much of international law has yet to e even be written. Um, these are all just really early building blocks in terms of a longer um, outlook towards how a framework for global governance could be established. But there are some serious weaknesses across each of those institutions and how they're structured to really afford the opportunity for genuine accountability. Uh, you've also described the domestic situations in the United States and Canada and how there are some instruments with modest amendment, really, uh, that could be effective in early steps um, toward uh, bilaterally accomplishing that same accountability. As a comment on the state of international law um, and these institutions in which we find ourselves in this powerful rivalry, uh, what do you see the future of uh, international law being um, and, and how the notions of accountability will be exercised? Well, I'm an optimist. So I think that international law is and should be here to stay. I think that COVID has really just spotlighted some of the weaknesses that have always been there. And we should be taking a good hard look at how we can adjust our systems moving forward to better serve the current reality. I mean, we did that after the SARS outbreak. The international health regulations were significantly amended after that. Turns out, not quite enough. But I, I think that this is a great opportunity for the world and specifically international institutions to look at where the gaps are and what needs to be changed. And so you see this as a bit of a precedent then in defining what our next steps could be in, in shaping institutions globally and our, even our own domestic legislation. Yes, absolutely. Well, what do you what do you think, though? Like, you know, we saw you and I were corresponding just recently about this new agreement that China had made with Iran on a 25 year strategic partnership. Um, right. Do, do you sense that these regimes are um, intentionally coordinating across the international space uh, to weaken these institutions or are they acting individually? It's hard to speculate as to their internal motivations. Who knows, right? I mean, China and Iran have been, have had a relationship for a long time. That's why uh, Iran was such an early hotspot. It was because of all this travel between Iran and China. Uh, I think it, the, the theory is that it came from an Iranian uh, businessman who traveled uh, to and from China. There's these links between these two countries. It's not a new thing. So it's, you know, if the depth is is changing and it's becoming more explicit, yeah, it's it's concerning. I mean, who knows who knows why though? It's hard to speculate.
It is, it is. I, I pick up one of the points of agreement that they had announced was the, um, the idea of cooperating in multilateral spaces. And sometimes that can yeah. be throw, throwaway language between governments and regimes. But I have a feeling my instinct is based on the global reorder that we are in amidst, that they are looking to try and establish a, a rival international system of agreements, um, probably motivated around a China hub and spoke model in which China is at uh, the beating heart of a different type of international order. So when you, when, if that is even remotely a possibility, what do you think that has as implications for Canada in terms of what we need to be doing in our relations with both China and with Iran? And what would you advise political leaders in Canada to consider when they are thinking about these two countries? I think the thing that's most clear is that appeasement doesn't work and that we need a serious rethink of how we approach our diplomacy with China. If you look even at, you know, the case of the two Michaels and the debate that that's caused, it's we need to be stronger and we need to make sure that we're taking a stand for our democratic values. That's excellent. Um, and I guess a big part of that is taking the time to understand the nature of these regimes for what they are. Yes, exactly. These are not democratic countries. Nor are they trying to be democratic. Yes, exactly. And I think your report reflects on that a little bit too, because I think if these countries were ones that were at least aspiring for transition or seeking to pursue reform, um, that there might be a different assessment of how they would be treated internationally. I, do you think that that would have consequence in, in, in litigating uh, these issues anywhere? Sure. I mean, I think David Mata says this in the in the introduction. If these countries were transitioning to a democracy, that would, of course, change the calculus we bring to the table. We might not want to pursue as aggressive legal solutions because we would want to encourage that transition. Since that's not happening, the focus should be on uh, prevention and on protecting our own people, our own citizens and permanent residents, everyone in Canada, so that uh, they're to just to minimize the hurt that's been caused by this and going forward in similar situations. Well, excellent. Well, Sarah Teach, thank you so much for a stimulating conversation across the global dimensions of how this, this pandemic actually does have a face. It has two regimes. Um, thank you for providing instruments on how Canadian policymakers can consider their actions internationally and even domestically. Uh, and for the recommendations of your paper, uh, like I said, I think this is probably one of the most important papers that the Institute could publish with you. Uh, I hope it's the first of many more to come because I think you have a lot to offer in helping guide Canadians and Canadian policymakers on navigating this rubric of asymmetric threats to the country, whether it's state-based or terror-based. Um, and uh, the country benefits greatly from your research. So thank you so very much for taking some time to go through all these issues with us today and allow me to encourage all the listeners and viewers of this to, uh, to take the time to download the report, read it, share it, uh, and then take it to the parliamentarians, take it to the decision makers you know, and say, you do have, you do have tools, you do have options. Uh, please explore them to the best of your ability. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve.